thank you everyone for attending. Um, really excited about Mass Bioplasin Advocacy Summit. Really excited for this panel. Um, ooh, Mike. All right. Uh, so the impetus for this panel um, was because we recognize that at this summit, we get a lot of people um, and a lot of folks who recognize the philosophy and believe in the philosophy of engaging the patient community, incorporating the patient perspective into all of the decisions that we make. And of course, we obviously get a lot of folks who have that experience in the United States. And the question that we get and a lot of the discussions that we have are around how does that apply outside of the United States? How do we take what we know and how do we take that philosophy of what we do in the United States and apply that ex-US? Um, so when we were looking at what panels we should have here and what discussions we should have, this became a really prominent topic. Uh, and when we were looking at which panelists to include, what we were really excited about was that we could actually invite people who don't actually have the patient advocacy title. These are folks who don't work in the patient advocacy function. They work in other functions that work globally and incorporate patient advocacy and the patient perspective into the work that they do every day. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to our panelists. Um, and I'll start from the far right, and then we'll, we'll move over. Hi, I'm Jennifer Panagulia. Um, I'm head of regulatory affairs at Wave Life Sciences. It's a small biotech company in Cambridge focused on uh, developing therapies for rare neurologic diseases. We have a clinical program in Huntington's disease. And uh, by the end of the year, we'll also have a program in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, I've been in regulatory for about 20 years, 16 of which I spent at Genzyme. And I see some old friends in the audience today. Good to be here. Um, in my time at Genzyme, I worked in the rare disease unit for 10 years um, on the development, primarily on the development of two therapies for Pompe disease, myozyme and lumozyme. Um, and through that experience, I had uh, global registration activities for that product um, and lots of engagement with um, global patient organizations throughout that program. Um, and I'm here today, I'm really excited to be here today, not just because I hope to share my regulatory viewpoint. Um, but also to tell you that I have the view of being a member of a patient organization. I have a niece who lives in Massachusetts who has Angelman syndrome, which is a rare genetic disease. Um, and together with my family, I'm a member of a local uh, chapter of the Angelman Foundation and a national organization um, that's focused on raising funds for research in Angelman. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Laura Sandler. I am leading the clinical operations function at CRISPR Therapeutics. CRISPR Therapeutics is a small uh, biotech uh, based in Cambridge, um, primarily a research-based organization, quickly be, uh, pivoting to become a development-based organization. Uh, we are using a gene editing platform, CRISPR-Cas9 platform, to target uh, serious rare genetic diseases um, in addition to having um, an immuno-oncology portfolio as well as um, expanding further into potentially neuromuscular diseases and others. Um, thrilled to be here. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to join you. Uh, I have, you know, 16, 17 years experience in drug development. Um, the past, most of which has been in oncology, um, in operations functions of varying capacity. Um, the past four and a half years working specifically in gene therapy and gene editing for uh, rare diseases and um, hoping to um, share some um, relevant experience that you might find helpful. Hi, everybody. My name is Jen Watts. I am an Associate Director of Clinical Science Expert, which really just means I'm a clinical trial leader at <laughs> NIBR um, or NIBR. Um, I'm from Texas at Alcon. We called it NIBR. And so when I came here, everybody said, everyone said NIBR. And I was like, so confused. But anyway, um, <laughs> what I hope, in addition to my day job of being a clinical trial leader, I'm also a patient advocate at Nibber. And so um, what I think is really exciting about this role is that, you know, for years, I've done the clinical trial management um, role since 2002. And, you know, from 2002 to 2008, for me it was really, if I wanted to know about the patient's disease process, not just, just what they're experiencing on the clinical trial or when they go home, I had to get that from my study coordinator or talking to my sub-I or the PI if he wasn't too busy. 
But you know, now I think it's so it's it's amazing that we can have this one-on-one -on -one, um, discussion directly with the patient through the patient advocacy groups to really get direct feedback because you know I'm the one writing the protocol, so I got a lot of power there. <laughs> you know, I do the trial budget and I get it. So um, so I think you know one of the things that um, I'm going to plug myself right here. I want to meet as many of you today as I can at lunch and um, afterwards. Um, I brought as many cards as I could fit into my purse. And so, because, uh, you know, at, at Nibber, Niber, um, we have over 400 projects right now going on. And I specialize right now in um, ophthalmology. But, you know, I, if somebody needs help in respiratory or any of the other groups, you know, I, I touch a lot of things. And, they, and we have some really great, great clinical trial leaders at Nibber. So I would love to connect you with those projects. So please just don't feel, don't hesitate. I do not bite, I promise. <laughs> um, please, you know, come shake my hand. I'd love to give you a card. Okay, I'm done plugging. <laughs> Never right now. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, actually, as you did the introductions, I realized I didn't introduce myself. Um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll do that right now. Uh, Michelle Ree, I, as Bob said, I head patient affairs at Enzavant. Enzavant is a, a rare disease startup, so we specialize in rare diseases. Uh, the way that we work is actually identifying assets that are not being developed um, that we believe really do have potential, and then working on them, getting them to market as quickly as possible. Um, right now, we're working in complete DeGeorge syndrome and Farber disease, which most folks have probably never heard of, um, similar to many other rare diseases. Um, I have been in the rare disease and cancer patient advocacy space for, oh, I hate doing that math, so I'm not going to, but for <laughs> a number of years. Um, very involved with mass bio patient advocacy, and uh, I'm just so thrilled that we are able to have this panel because Bob and I were also talking about this so often um, panels are dominated by men and even though patient advocacy tends to swing more female um, even though we don't have this isn't a panel of just patient advocacy um, staff this is an all-female panel and Bob was commenting on that and this is actually very impressive also so uh, that was exciting for us um, so we're going to spend the first portion of this uh, panel talking specifically around some of the topics that have been raised in conversations, um, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So the first thing that um, I've heard a lot from folks and that we had been discussing was that the global guidelines outside of the US, especially in the EU, are very vague <laughs> for anyone who has looked at them. Um, and so in practice, it can be hard sometimes to figure out what that means. And so I'll open it up to the panel and just sort of ask for all of you, what has that meant in implementation for you? Uh, I'll start. Um, so uh, in, the, in the regulatory setting, I think um, if, we start, if we start with the US, we think of communications with, um, with patient groups, you know, messages going outside the company in the pre-approval stage and then in the post-approval stage. Um, there are regulations in the U.S. Um, when you're in the clinic, when you're in an investigation, um, that there can be no pre-approval promotion. And so the guideline is essentially that you're not promoting. You're having scientific exchange. You're collecting information that's valuable to the development. You're getting the patient perspective, but you're not promoting. In post-approval setting, um, you can communicate more. I think about the product, but it just has to be on label. Um, in Europe, there is essentially no promotion of any kind. There's no advertising. Um, and so that's why I think um, the risk tolerance is different sometimes in Europe. Um, but I think you can largely follow the same guideline in, in communicating, which is it needs to be scientific. Um, you need to have the right people at the company doing that. And by that, I mean, you know, it's not the sales force that's communicating. Um, it's really, you know, it's the patient advocates, it's the clinical staff, it's the medical staff. And that's sort of the right, the right forum for that communication. Yeah, so I'll add on to that. Um, when Michelle um, approached me about this panel, I was really excited. And I said, OK, I, let me do a little research. I'm not sure myself. Let me do some homework. And so um, got in touch with some uh, regulatory affairs experts, both you know, internally and externally, consultants who work exclusively in the EU. And I said, what can you tell me about actual regulations governing patient engagement. And I'm not talking about trial engagement, specifically as governed by clinical trial directors in Europe, but, but patient advocacy and so forth. And the repeated feedback I got was, 
well, it's really scarce. <laughs> so I said, well, what does that mean? They said there really isn't a, uh, and this is not just from one source, multiple sources, a guidance from EMA regarding um, patient advocacy engagement, which I thought was really interesting. Um, to that end, when we digged a little bit further, uh, it's, it's challenging because it seems a little bit of a juxtaposition because if you were um, just to simply look around the EMA website and look at the um, drug uh, medicinal life cycle um, up, you know, development and approval process, there are uh, slides, there's actually one that I found that says patient input all over the place. Um, which I think is really great, but yet I don't know that there's the framework yet that exists on how that's implemented. So I think that that's a really interesting, important gap. One thing that we did um, learn is that um, back in the um, middle of 2016, um, a working group of some kind was, some kind was formed between uh, EMA and FDA regarding exchange of information um, and best practices around patient engagement. So uh, I'm anxious to see some of the output from that. Um, but I found it a really interesting exercise when we actually looked at, you know, rule of law that there really wasn't much to go on. So I think that's a great opportunity to leave it open to interpretation based on individual um, development needs, um, you know, depending on what disease area you're working in and what kind of organization you're working with. Working with some, um, some of the foundations and patient, patient advocacy groups, what I found very helpful in navigating in this environment is a lot of them do have codes of conduct. So how do they, oh, excuse me, how do they, um, how, how should their interaction be with us, and, you know, from the pharma side or, um, and so I, I, I found those to be quite helpful. Um, I do also find that sometimes we do get lost in the, um, the, the legal regulatory battle, at least um, from what I've worked on, and, and really helping them to understand that there is, we're not trying to promote, we, we are trying to have that scientific exchange. But we really want to hear the voice of the patient and the caregiver to really understand what we need to put in, into our peer rows, into our um, clinical study designs, um, and in order to also make things move faster. Because things just, we, get, we just discuss, discuss, discuss. I know you've all been to the meetings that turn into another meeting, turn into another meeting, and nothing ever gets done. That's what we're trying to prevent. And I think, you know, taking that code of conduct and showing, you know, here's what this group is doing. Let's take from that, and this is, you know, legal. This is what I'm showing you. We're going to work scientifically. There is no promotion, you know. So we've, we've had to use um, some of the codes of conduct to help reinforce that on some of our projects. Yeah. There, are, there are some organizations um, in the EU, like Estia, that have guidelines that are a little bit more discreet, but there isn't that much. Um, we had earlier been talking about um, that depending on the size of the company and the stage of the company, the concreteness of the regulations will vary. Um, and Jennifer, I don't know if you want to talk about sort of the difference between a market, a company with a marketed product versus a non-marketed product and um, how that, uh, uh, what that means for the differences in regulations. I, I think it impacts the risk tolerance because um, when you have a marketed product, um, there, you know, there is other regulations that apply like Sunshine Act, um, more so when you're dealing with physicians and, and in, its, in essence, um, engaging them to, um, you know, be part of advisory boards or um, you're working on different, um, actually, promotional activities. So you have to be um, thinking about that. And uh, when you have a product on the market, um, some of the activities that you have, even at the patient level um, or at a group level, could be interpreted as promotional in that setting. And I think that's why sometimes your regulatory colleagues or your legal colleagues um, might have, you know, um, uh, less risk tolerance in that setting, more, you know, a narrower view of how the communications can, um, you know, the tone and sort of the tenor of those communications in light of the fact that you have that product on the market. And so the regulations are a little bit stricter about what you say. And I think actually we had, <laughs> from that, <laughs> we ended up talking around um, different countries as well and how certain countries are almost like favorites to work with. Um, because the, the regulations vary. I think you had said, like, Germany. <laughs> I was like, U.S. Germany for me. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little well, Part of it is, too, in, within at least the NIBR organization, we have some very, very strong country organizations um, that we have built over time. So um, in the U.S. and in Germany, or they're just two examples in at least an ophthalmic that we really love to work in um, because we have worked through the gray areas and, have, and, and are able to really reach out and 
engage very quickly, easily, and successfully. And I think, um, you know, I, the, what we're trying to do is break through from that and, you know, working with foundations. It was, and, but I will say, I had an interesting conversation yesterday when I was in the office with someone and I brought up a particular foundation and the comment to me was, they're like the mafia. And I was like, <laughs> who said that about a patient foundation? You know, and, but it was so interesting that that's how much, how important it is to make sure that that foundation is working with you and working strongly with you and to have that, to, you know, I mean, that's what I actually, my face, I hope he didn't see the surprise and I was like, why would you say that? But, you know, but it was great that I had that solicited feedback. So think about that. That's how, that's, I mean, some companies are looking at this like, how can we work with them and successfully and within regulation? And it's just amazing to me. But kind of going back to that too is, you know, some of the organizations that, at least in ophthalmics that we've worked with, we've, over the time, we have this great relationship and we're, they're able to easily communicate with us and easily, you know, if they have an idea or if they, you know, we work with them in very early development. So we're like pre, and I'm in um, early development. I'm not, I've, I've worked in late phase in medical affairs, but um, now I'm back to preclinical. Um, and in this stage, you know, where we're trying to select the compound, that's what we really need to be finding and talking to the patient engagement and advocacy groups out there just to really find out, you know, what are your concerns and where, you know, we have this molecule that we think might could do like 10 different things. Where should we put that? Where should we put our effort into? Because who are the patients, you know, and that's the thing. There's so many, you know, one molecule, I mean, sometimes, you know, we, you can test it for 10 different indications spanning 10 different therapeutic areas. So. Um, so I, I really think that like that that a, could be a big part of it. Just really trying to think broader outside of just these two countries that are easy to work with, and go to those harder countries. Go to the mafia if you need to, you know, to get that information that you need. <laughs> in context. Yeah, oh in no, no, context. that's totally. That's what I meant. It was not the actual truth. Actually, yeah, that's right. In Dallas, we really don't have what you guys have here <laughs> regarding that history. So sorry about that. Um, but yeah, but. but like going to the or, those organizations because those are who have that great feedback. We need to get that from them. But mm -hmm. the first step is having that open communication and dialogue and being open to for organizations to come to us. But us also, and you know, one of the biggest things that come up in our meetings is how do we approach you? You know, how do we approach the advocacy group? Do we just send an email? <laughs> is that appropriate? You know, or, you know, when we um, meet you guys at conferences and things like that, like, you know, what is that best exchange? So that, you know, that, that is a huge question for us, at least in my group, trying to find out where can I find outside of these two countries that we are easy to work with, other places, other avenues. And actually, connected to that and connected to something you said a little earlier about patient advocacy groups having their own guidelines. Um, Patient advocacy groups can be really good resources for helping you navigate what a country's guidelines are, especially some of the regional uh, patient advocacy groups. So in Europe, for example, um, a disease-specific organization will really help you navigate some of the individual countries. Um, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but <laughs> if, <laughs> I think you may have had engagement with some of the regional European disease-specific patient advocacy groups? Um, so I have in, in some cases, particularly looking at hemoglobinopsies, um, rare blood disorders like beta thalassemia and sickle cell. But before I forget, because um, I'm <laughs> likely to do that, what, um, one thing I want to comment on um, that Jen had mentioned, which I think is really important as we think about regulatory landscape, I think more often than not, when we talk about regulatory landscape, we sort of are assuming we're dealing with marketed products or or um, near marketed products. Most of my, oops, sorry. <laughs> most of my um, professional development experience has been in early phase, right? Um, first in human, phase one, um, uh, phase two work. And um, it's, um, it's interesting to me because more often than not, in my experience, patient advocacy has not had a seat at the table early on in the de drug development process. And, and that said, especially as you have organizations, large and small, who are especially focused in areas of unmet, need, unmet medical need, looking at, in particular, rare diseases, 
Um, from a sponsor perspective, and when we think about regulatory implications, and as we design our you know, target product profile, and we're designing you know, these overarching development strategies, as we work in, in, as I said, more rare indications and diseases, I think it's really critical that patient advocacy is brought to the table, both from a representative perspective as well as truly a patient informative perspective, because you know, the name of the game, and I don't want to call it a game, but the goal is to get therapies to patients who need it as quickly as possible. So you have regulators, be it in the EU, for example, like Prime Designation, which is going to grant accelerated access and approval and reviews and partnerships with sponsor companies. If you're, you know, in a development situation where you're trying to be creative to accelerate that path and you're looking at a first in human trial, and perhaps that first in human trial, depending on the disease you're treating, could morph and actually become your pivotal registration trial, one and the same, either by expansion or by design from the beginning. The challenge is I find it not having patient advocacy at the table and patient representatives helping you define your endpoints, helping you define your inclusion, exclusion, really truly understanding the unmet medical need early on, if that's your paradigm, I think is a mistake to not include that. And so that's been a challenge I know I personally have encountered. And so, you know, when we think about navigating the environment, I think we need to think early um, and as early as, as we can, especially given the, the, you know, unique nature of some of these um, therapeutics. So that was one comment that I wanted to get <laughs> out. Can I comment off of your comment? Yes. <laughs> I will say if you don't do it, guess what it's going to cost you money? Why? Because you're going to have a protocol amendment. <laughs> it always happens. Like sometimes I have this medical expert and they're like, this is the perfect population. I was like, doesn't exist. <laughs> Are you sure you want? Okay. And I was like, you know, we're going to have, a, and this actually happened two years ago in a project. I was like, yeah, we're going to have a protocol amendment in about three months, just letting you know. And then sure enough, in three months, because they didn't listen, and then the investigators gave us the feedback that those patients do not exist, hence we had a protocol amendment. So if they, we would have listened to the patients or the sub-eyes and the study coordinators and the PIs, the key opinion leaders from the beginning, we wouldn't have had that problem. Hey, I just want to build off that because I think we never want to go into a regulatory agency and agree to a protocol that we can't deliver on. That's, that's a problem. And so I agree with everything that's been said here, especially in the setting of rare disease. You do need that seat at the table and that voice. And I've personally had the experience over the course of my career where we have gone to FDA in particular with feedback relative to inclusion criteria for a protocol. And, you know, they, when a sponsor doesn't want to agree to something, I think the you know, the tendency of the agency is to think, well, you just don't want to do it, but we're going to make you do it. <laughs> but, but I've had conversations where we said, listen, we've had, you know, um, meetings with three different patient organizations, and they are telling us that they're not going to enroll in this study, or we can't, you know, we can't enroll unless we change the criteria to this. And I've actually had a negotiation with them on that point and been successful in them understanding it's, it's not just us not wanting to do it. We're, we're talking about feasibility, and it doesn't help us or the patient community if we embark upon a study that we can't complete. And I think that's an interesting addendum to the marketed versus non-marketed product company uh, question because the closer you get to having a marketed product, the more careful companies will be about their type of engagement and how they engage and which regulations they follow. And if you're in the situation where your non-marketed first in human could potentially become that pivotal trial, then companies are a little more wary and more likely to start acting like a company with a marketed product a little earlier. I think also um, as a sponsor company, I think sometimes we get in the mindset that we assume the regulators understand the diseases, right? I, I think we assume that they are somehow experts. Um, and in my experience, I have found that, you know, as, as you work in drug development, it is your responsibility to often educate um, um, regulators as part of the process, again, particularly in rare disease. And so to that point around bringing advocacy groups and patients to the table early on, be it in the form of um, you know, uh, patient advisory meetings, uh, patient ad boards, um, be it through partnerships um, with um, patient thought leaders and so forth, I think we also, again, as an American, um, with a U.S.-based company, um, for the most part, we, we tend to be U.S.-centric. And, and oftentimes, I think, again, when you're thinking about a global you know, development strategy, my experience has been U.S. forefront, even from a commercial perspective, 
Um, and not necessarily taking into account, again, unless you have a rare disease, you know, focus in a specific region of the world, but if you have a global disease, the focus still tends to be North America centric. And so bringing in the thought process and the thought leaders, be it patient, ab you know, advisory boards kind of thing, not just US centric, but think about long term, what would be appropriate based on your, you know, um, anticipated um, development strategy and certainly approval of regulatory design pathway. Um, so I think that that's something that we really need to work on. Additionally, partner early um, I, with, you know, if the intent is to not participate in traditional drug development with, you know, double blind, you know, controlled trials because that's, you know, um, not going to be the best or most efficient way for you to develop your product, again, if we're talking about rare disease, you know, the value of patient advocacy groups and white papers and really meeting the needs of the advocacy groups who say, you know what, this is our need. Um, let's partner together and educate, you know, not just regulators, but the community and the world at large of what it means to, to have this medical need and how it can be filled. And I think if we do that sooner, it's gonna benefit um, everyone potentially in the long run. And so that would be something that I would try and think about implementing, you know, for any project I'm working on, be it now or in the future. And some of the more sophisticated EU groups, um, especially those umbrella groups, really do have the ability to do that. They have the scientific staff on board. They're able to really supplement and help do that. Um, I think the, the, the role of the patient advocacy group in the US versus the EU, in many cases, is similar in that, that they're able to provide that expertise and provide that support to do those types of white papers. Um, have you noticed any other sort of similarities or differences in what patient advocacy groups are able to either do or not do? Um, I think, you know, I haven't in my experience, I haven't noticed on the development side a tremendous amount of difference in what the patient advocacy organization can do or not do. I think they engage with the company. Um, they want to know what's going on and, and we get their feedback. And I think that that's um, important and, and very much accepted from a regulatory perspective in the development phase. I think a lot of the initiatives um, over the past six years under Padupa 5 in the US with the Voice of the Patient series and similarly in Europe, I think for a long time they focused on the need to have um, you know, patient reported outcomes um, and endpoints that really look at how the patient feels and functions um, as an important part of the development program sort of um, you know, validates the fact that the patient is a key stakeholder and they need to be part of the process. And so uh, you can communicate, you know, under the umbrella of, again, scientific exchange um, and development. And so I, I think it, you know, globally it's been relatively similar, similar for me in that regard. Um, Jen, that group that you had mentioned was like the mafia. <laughs> were were Those they? Those are not my words, okay. <laughs> I mean, they were today, but not yesterday. Anyway. Um, was that a group in the EU? Um, it, it, it's a group that spans globally, mm -hmm. um, but they were particularly talking about the, their EU counter, the EU group themselves. But it, were they like a gatekeeper? They were absolutely a gatekeeper. So in this particular organization, as um, my colleague had mentioned, you know, um, without without their basically not just consent but just approval of your protocol, you can't go anywhere. So what do you do when? You know, you as a company, there's some driving reason why you need to get, let's say it's a not exciting registry, but there's some reason that we need this. Maybe it's a post marketing requirement or uh, something like that that, you know, but it's not, it's, it's not a beautiful project. It's not interesting. It's not going to, you know, maybe it doesn't generate as much information. So how, how do we work around that? So, you know, you know, at that point, you know, we're going to countries that literally, I mean, do not have the patient numbers. We're spending lots and lots of money to open up in like, you know, very small countries outside of their realm when, you know, you know if, if we had better exchange or better communication to show that value of this particular project, could we better spend that money on getting new medicine to market, you know? Because if we have a, a PMR, <laughs> but I, I, we have to do it, you know? There's no going around that. So I think that's some, sometimes some of the challenges we face too when working um, in the EU environment. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything similar to that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, I, again, I, I had a thought. Um, that's where I lose it. Um, 
So, you know, it's somewhat building off of that. You know, I'm looking, I can see the projected screen right here, and, you know, in the corner of my eye, I keep seeing regulatory environment, regulatory environment. And I think just by the nature of the words, it implicitly uh, it triggers some sort of response where you're saying black and white. It's either, you know, A or B, yes or no, it's binary. And truth be told, all of our operating procedures at all the places we work are, are all different because they're all interpretations of, you know, regulations. And so I think from a mindset perspective, it's important to, and, and I'm just speaking in general, to approach um, even navigating your own organizations if you have the idea of partnership or, or the kinds of things we're talking about to help, you know, streamline things um, with an open mind um, and, and, you know, making sure that there's, there's people who are looking at things not just in a binary way with regard to engagement and so forth. One of the things I thought of, again, before I forget, um, is, uh, you know, in the world of, of social media, right, and, and uh, you know, digital access and platform accessibility, um, how that uh, interacts with regulations, right? So, um, I, you know, I, there, I believe the FDA might have a guidance um, that's either published or under, under um, development around um, um, social media um, and interaction as it relates to trials. But one thing that I think is important for advocacy groups is to partner with sponsor companies around social media, given that the public nature of um, you know, patient experience could be viewed by anybody, potentially. Yeah. And so the implications of that, even if you put all this effort up front and you have patient advocacy stakeholders and you have the patient voice and you've developed a, you know, a, a development program, let's say, to be able to meet that unmet medical need, are there, is there the potential that your data integrity is going to you know, go out the window because of the nature of the world we live in in terms of access to information? So uh, from personal experience, as an example, um, imagine, you know, an open label study, right? Um, and, and, you know, patients are being treated and are discussing their experiences openly on social media platforms. And advocacy groups are, are you know, retweeting or forwarding or whatever, you know, um, that information. The value and the benefit I can understand from the perspective of the advocacy group as a sponsor, it, you know, caused panic. Right, <laughs> because now the data potentially um, that you're collecting could be brought into question, you know, in terms of validity and so forth, as well as safety implications and reporting. Um, so one of the things I think it's really important to think about in the regulatory environment, and I don't know that the Europeans have gone there yet, is how we are going to address that um, in the the development space, um, and how advocacy groups can hopefully partner and with. Um, biopharmaceutical companies that are trying to maintain some integrity around their data in the in the world that we live in, um, and that you, you don't want to be we don't want to be adversaries. Um, everybody has intent, but to understand that the the sponsor company has reasons for wanting to keep the data quiet and controlled and contained. Advocacy groups, let's say, because it's great and it's favorable, and and there's a patient saying tweeting, "I feel wonderful on this study drug." Um, what the implications are and, and the need of the advocacy group to want to share that information, but there has got to be some sort of bridge where everyone, I think, needs to align, um, particularly in an open label case, and that's something I would encourage everyone to do early on. So if you're working um, as a patient advocate, um, um, not in a sponsor company or in a sponsor company, how can we have those conversations, again, before we get into development, um, rather than reactionary, right? Because we've all been in that reactionary space where, um, you know, there's my, the patient on the trial is tweeting, what do we do, right? Um, and so I, there might be a few hands in this room where, you know, people say, yeah, it's in there. Um, so just one thought. Yeah, building off of that, um, I can give you an example. So I think what you will start to see is, um, especially in the rare disease space, uh, companies that have, um, as part of the, you know, either the eligibility criteria for the trial or other instructions that um, they ask patients not to communicate on social media. Um, and I know this for a fact because um, in Angelman syndrome, I mentioned my niece, um, there's a company that has a trial ongoing of a symptomatic therapy, and my sister was very interested in trying to get uh, my niece into this study, and we went to a, uh, a patient summit, and this company came, and they presented, and that was one of the inclusion criteria, is that you had to agree that while you, your child was a participant in the study, um, you would not communicate on social media uh, about your results. Um, and they explained in that forum that, you know, they were very hopeful 
that based off of the results of this study, they would be able to approach FDA um, with a registration package, and therefore they really didn't want to have people, you know, weighing in on I'm not feeling good or I'm feeling terrific. Um, and they, they discussed it in that forum, and I would say largely, um, you know, my sister and other people in the audience understood where they were coming from. Um, and, and, and I think the explaining why the company went a long way in, in doing that uh, it was helpful. We always worry about things getting reported that way, especially adverse events. Right. Um, you know, I think the other thing we have to keep in mind, though, is I know that that's my sister's connection. Social media is her connection to the global patient community. And so there still has to be a means for them to engage because, um, you know, it's so important that they get to share their experiences. It's, it, we don't want to... We don't want to stop that, but I think, you know, you, you may see a trend in that respect. Um, mindful, as in my role as a moderator, we have about 10 minutes left. I didn't realize time had flown so quickly. Um, so I'm actually going to switch over to Q&A. I think there are microphones. So as people get up to the microphones, if they have questions, I'm also going to ask the panelists to give one recommendation each. Um, as if anyone, I guess, has a question, they can or it looks like people are going around with microphones. So if anyone has a question, they can raise their hand. Uh, and then I'll ask the panelists going from Jen down to give their one recommendation. <laughs> I was waiting for a question. <laughs> okay, great. I would say my one recommendation is um, really to understand that from the sponsor pharma side, you know, we're, we really are here and we want to, there is so much excitement about patient engagement that, um, it, you know, it, that we don't know necessarily how excited we are to communicate that with you if you're in the um, advocacy organization. So please um, help us by also reaching out to us, reaching out to our groups. You know, I know a lot of our companies have um, at least, like, I'm in early development translational medicine. We have a, a social media platform now. So, you know, we can find, you know, we, we're posting um, stuff every, like a few times a week, but, you know, we want to hear from you all. So I think that would be the best first step is, um, help us reach out to you, but also reach out to us. Yeah. Um, so getting back to maybe the last point that um, I had suggested, I think partnering in the development space, um, partnering around information sharing um, and, and understanding um, expectations up front around um, communication of, of data and patient experience and why, um, you know, biopharmaceutical companies might be um, more hesitant for all these reasons, but the setting expectations at the get-go of, um, of a clinical study, I think, would be one of my, my recommendations. Um, I want to focus on relationships. I think that's an important um, aspect of, of, um, of communicating, and I was spoiled at Genzyme because I had a great patient advocacy team, and we had a great relationship, and that went a long way in us both understanding, you know, the needs of each group while, you know, regulatory, I think, often has a, a bad reputation of saying no all the time. Um, and so I think understanding the perspective, and they did a great job in educating me about why it was important to communicate on certain aspects of the program. And so we worked together to try to find solutions to communicate in a way that was, you know, uh, compliant. Um, but but informative for the, for the patient organizations. And I think having that relationship is important to do that. So I have just a quick initial thought from a, an experience. So um, 
uh, a particular patient advocacy group um, in the hemoglobinopathy space sponsors has an annual meeting. And they created a special day as a drug development forum. And they invited sponsor companies working in the space as well as members of the FDA. And so the FDA showed up um, and, you know, was there to listen. They actually had patients on ongoing trials speaking, but that's another story. Um, but they were there to listen to, um, you know, the needs of the patient. So what I would love to see translate um, into policy would be recognizing the FDA has limited resources, limited, you know, money, limited capabilities to be on the forefront of these voice of the patient meetings. How can advocacy groups drive their own with the expectation that the FDA is there and that they're going to listen and that there's an actual policy around the fact that they are committing to showing up? Um, and being engaged. Um, under tiers, you're referencing the uh, patient experience data uh, initiative. And through that, FDA is obligated to issue a series of guidances um, over the course of five years under FDUPA 6. Um, and they'll be having public meetings to get input on that. And I think three of the most important aspects are, one, FDA has to comment on the patient experience data that the sponsor submitted as part of their package when they review. Two, they have to issue a guidance on how to measure patient experience. Um, and three, they have to issue guidance on what they're going to do with it. So what I really want to see is what they're going to do with it. Because it's, you know, it's, it's important. We want to see them consider it in a meaningful way. Um, and, I, and I'd like to understand how it's going to be evaluated. And I would like to see that done consistently across the review divisions at FDA. Because I think you get great inconsistency from division to division on how they, uh, how they evaluate and utilize information. So I think that will be important. I also have one thing that I would like to see, and this isn't <laughs> the, the, in the rare disease community, one of the things that we have found is that um, sometimes if the disease area is small enough, a company has literally engaged with every single patient advocacy group in that disease area. And so when the FDA is looking for a neutral patient advocacy group or a neutral patient advocate to provide um, some insight into the patient experience, they cannot find a single patient advocate that the company has not engaged with. Um, and because of that, they, they're, they're looking for an unbiased viewpoint, which is completely understandable, but um, they don't have specific guidelines about what an unbiased patient or patient advocate is. Uh, and in the rare disease, ultra rare disease space, that makes it hard uh, for companies to know then what to do to, to in, in response to that. So if there was any guidance in that particular area, I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. And just to codify how patients are going to be, patient advocates are going to be involved in the review process in, in a way, a meaningful way. You know, is it specifically risk benefit? Is it specifically, you know, patient data? That would be really helpful and I, I think it would be um, important to actually, you know, codify or document a way that if they truly intend bring in the patient voice, how are you going to do it? Let us know. Actually, to that point, so the EMA, that slide that yes. Laura mentioned, the different points in time where they can bring in the patient perspective and the patient's voice, the EMA does have a list of patient advocacy groups that are sort of um, uh, the, the go-to patient advocacy groups that the EMA has sort of certified as being okay. Um, and they have met certain criteria. So that, that is something that regulatory agencies can do. And so, you know, again. But the, the sponsor can do it too. We, we have the prerogative of bringing that voice to the table, including bringing a representative to a meeting. You yes, know, when but, we want to. But the patient, but the FDA also does outreach to identify. Yes, absolutely. And both, so. both organizations. But I think it's important to also understand that the company can do that very early on, both in Europe and the U.S. Yes. Absolutely. Any other So at WAVE, we have Wendy Erler, who will be here to speak to you later today, who is amazing. 
Um, and she sits on all the program teams, or people that report to her sit to all the program teams, uh, sit on all the program teams, I should say. So even though we're a small company, um, that perspective is there all the time. Um, she's always providing insights, and I think it's so helpful, helpful from the outset to make sure that that's an important um, part of our development program. Um, and I mean, she, she gives us feedback. Uh, she gives us insights on development. She connects us with organizations to gather feedback. But she also just does an amazing job of um, bringing in individuals to educate the entire company um, outside of important development initiatives. And so I think it, it keeps us um, really grounded. Um, so thank you for that question. So right now, um, my organization does not have someone dedicated. Um, there are a number of roles where uh, a lot of people are you know, wearing multiple hats. Um, I was a man of one until recently. Uh, so um, I've been doing some of that work, partnering with, um, interestingly enough, some other people in um, business development, person in business development, so right now between the two of us. But it is something that's part of the, the overall growth plan um, as we look to get into the clinic um, in the future, for sure. Here at Nibber, we have um, quite a few projects, like I said, 400. Um, <laughs> and we, we cross so many different therapeutic areas. And so um, what we've done, and, and we're early, early development. We're not, you know, the global development where they have their own groups with medical affairs. I mean, they have this enormous group. We literally have a group of eight. So we have um, myself um, out of Dallas, and then we have one other person in Cambridge, three in um, Basel, and two in East Hanover. And that's it for patient engagement and advocacy right now. But we're looking to really expand over the next two years and to really take what we learn from you all and from the interactions with all of the, the groups that we've met today and to really build that and show that, well, it's not, it, just show the value of it, the added value to all of our projects. So a lot of us, this is our, our part-time um, part -time fun on the side um, activities, but we love it. <laughs> but it doesn't mean, we, you know, we don't pound the pavement or, or yeah. raise the issue internally all the time. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I'm that function at my company. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, uh, I actually, I report directly into the CEO, and uh, the reason that that was chosen and decided was because of the recognition that this function works across all functions and engages with all functions. Um, and I think that it's, it, it is that idea, and I think you can actually probably bring almost any function to a panel on patient advocacy and have a conversation about where you engage and how you engage. And it's a question about where can you have the most impact and how do you do it most efficiently. Um, I got a sign that said we have like 30 seconds, so <laughs> I think I think we're done. <laughs> Bob. <laughs>